Coming up on Colonial Crossfire, America bombs Syria. The Speaker retires. And Zuckerberg before Congress. Joining us on the left, Katie O'Connell. And on the right, Andrew Colreaser. And I'm your moderator, Casey Decker, from the GWTV studios in Washington, D.C. This is Colonial Crossfire. New attacks on Syria last week as America, Britain, and France launched a series of airstrikes on Syrian targets. The bombings in response to another suspected incident of the Assad regime using chemical weapons in its war with rebels. Our student panel is here to debate the decision and its consequences. On the left, Katie O'Connell, a senior from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, majoring in international affairs and political science. She's volunteered in the Obama White House and interned with the DNC. And on the right, Andrew Colreaser, a senior from Milan, Italy, majoring in international affairs. Le Andrew is a legislative correspondent for Congressman Bill Heisinga. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Thank Good morning. You. The complicated war in Syria has been going on for seven years now. American involvement has largely been marginal, but President Trump has now twice ordered strikes against the regime. And with so much volatility at the White House, questions about next steps loom large. Katie, we'll start with you. Were these strikes the right move? I personally think they were not. We saw a couple weeks ago Trump wanted to get out of Syria. He had made public that he wanted to get out of Syria. But now you have these strikes which are completely contradictory to what he was previously stating. And I think it is volatile when you're thinking about the resources, the money that's used, when you're thinking about the sheer lives that are being costed at this. Of course, he targeted the, um, the chemical weapons that were allegedly used. But you're looking at this contradictory from public statements from the White House and from the overall, I guess, the message that he's sending to the public that we want to get out of Syrians. Majority of Americans don't want to be in Syria, and yet you have these contradictory actions. I think it's, it's sending a mixed message. If he wasn't sending a mixed message, though, if he had always come in saying, we're going to attack Syria, we're going to make sure they don't use chemical weapons, would you have supported that? No. I think, you, and a lot of people will say, well, look, Obama did it. But isn't that just it? He did it, and Assad still was using chemical weapons, so why are we continuing to use uh, airstrikes against Syria if we have seen in the past that it hasn't worked? Again, going back to the idea that it's wasting resources and it's wasting money by continuing using these violent, very violent attacks that clearly haven't worked in the past. If you're hammering a nail and you're coming at it at the same way and it's not going in, why would you keep hammering the nail in the same angle? You're going to try and come at it from another angle so as to not you know, waste energy. Now, Andrew, what impact do you think these strikes will have? Well, first and foremost, allow me to say that uh, I'm representing here my own views and not that of, of Congressman Heisinga. Now, first and foremost, let it be clear, Obama never launched strikes like President Trump in Syria to stop chemical weapons. So I applaud the president for not only cementing American resolve against the horrendous use of chemical weapons in general, but also to explaining with clear strategy what these strikes were intended to do, and that is deter future use of chemical weapons and to destroy ISIS in Syria. And let's not forget, the Trump administration launched these strikes because Obama failed to uphold the red line in 2013. And uh, it's, it's an absolute misunderstanding, I think, in my opinion, to say that this is a continuation of past policies. No. This is the start of new policies where America will not allow horrendous use of chemical weapons in the Middle East. Now, President Trump has launched attacks against Syria in the past, and almost in his first few months in office, he launched attacks against Syria, and those apparently didn't seem to work. Do you think that these ones will? Yes, and the reason is because uh, compared to the April 4th, 2017 attacks in which 59 Tomahawk missiles were launch launched, and last week's attack, these are compounding, exponentially growing responses uh, to Assad's use of chemical weapons. And it sends a clear message, quite frankly, that if you keep going and define the international community who condemns the use of chemical weapons, as they very well should, that the response will only be bigger, larger, and more detrimental to the Assad regime. So I fear, actually, I don't want to know what Trump will do uh, should Assad choose to launch another chemical weapon, because in my understanding, he knows the consequences will grow. So what of it then that he acted unilaterally without the authorization of Congress? And we're actually going to get to that one in just a okay. moment. Uh, I, before that, though, I want to ask you what you think the significance of Britain and France joining in on these airstrikes is. I'll ask you first. Um, 
I definitely think it shows, obviously, our alliance with Western European countries. But it's clear that the UN obviously was very anti us going in and using these airstrikes. This was seen back when Obama did it. It's even seen now. I think it's detrimental to not have a more cohesive international community consensus when we're going into places as, as tumultuous as Syria. And even polled with Americans, the majority of Americans believe that this is an international concern and that they don't think that these airstrikes solely from the US, from France, and from Britain are going to deter Assad from future attacks on chemical with chemical weapons. So I think it is detrimental if you're just having just three out of the over 190 countries in the world just acting solely on the on Syria. You need to have an a international consensus. I, I Andrew, think. in your view, what's the significance of Britain and France joining in on this? I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful, and I agree with you, Katie. It does show that there is a strong alliance with the Western, our Western allies, which, by the way, up until these strikes happened, the, uh, the mainstream media, the uh, Democratic uh, congressional and, and DNC leaders had, had said that the, our Western leaders had abandoned us because of the Trump administration. And this strike sends a clear message. No, no. Paris and London, they are our friends, and we will continue to work with them. And you say that there should be a, a more international consensus. Qatar? Uh, Qatar? UAE, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Turkey were not only informed about these strikes, but they actually supported them. And uh, the, the, there has been no condemnation from the EU. There has been no condemnation around the world. The only condemnation has been from Russia, Iran, and Syria. All right, now I do want to move on to the question you raised about war powers. So, Andrew, I'll ask you first, should the president have asked Congress for permission before launching these strikes? No. Under Article 2, it states very clearly in the Constitution that the president has the right to use military force to protect our national interest. Now, Obama used an AUMF, an authorization of use of military force, from 2001 to launch, to overthrow Gaddafi, launch these, uh, a concerto of devastating attacks uh, on, on, on a sovereign nation. He used the AUMF to uh, authorize drones in Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia, Chad, killing I don't even know how many thousands of civilians. And, uh, and now to say that the, the Congre uh, that the Congress needs to authorize simple strikes that were conducted with Paris, with London, that lasted about 19 minutes, I believe. No, no, no. This is not a declaration of war. And Article 2 clearly states the president has the authority. Katie, are you concerned about the use of war powers? Absolutely. I think the last time war was declared was in World War II. And ever since then, the president has been using the president has been exceeding their power, and this is, I think, making the overall constitutional authorities of Congress almost obsolete. And at this point, then, what is to say, then, of the president just going and using war powers or using these assault um, weapons in any capacity and anything that he doesn't like agree president with? Like President Obama did in Libya and like how he did with the drone strikes? I completely agree that this, uh, there has been a precedent set by Barack Obama and, quite frankly, by George W. Bush as well, going into... Uh, uh, Afghanistan, remember the vote was for Iraq, and uh, it's, it, this is a precedent set and expanded by President Obama. Now let's not forget, what was Obama's strategy to Assad? Operation Timber Sycamore, this was a covert operation right, led by the to, CIA. We're going to have to make and sure we don't get too far off track here because we have a lot of content we have to cover. Covert. Um, I would just say... Real quick and then we can move on to the next question. Sure. So don't you think then it is the responsibility of President Trump to as a lot of Republicans want, fix the errors of the Obama era, of the Obama era then? If you don't agree that uh, Obama should have acted unilaterally, then why is it okay for Trump to do it? I never said that it was an, I never said these things. You All I said- it. You applauded the president for his actions. Yes, of course I did. And you know why? Because it sets a clear message and he took advantage of a precedent set by Obama that wanted a covert war in Syria that launched and toppled the sovereign nation and that conducted drone strikes like it was, uh, you know, his hobby. So please. All right, now we're going to move on to another important issue within the Syrian issue. The war, of course, is massively complicated, and we won't be able to come close to touching on every aspect of it here. But one important element is the Russian support for Assad. Russia, of course, has a large military presence in Syria right now and has served as a roadblock to other countries' actions against the current regime. Here's Defense Secretary Mattis talking about one such roadblock. I believe there was a chemical attack, and we're looking for the actual evidence. The, uh, the OPCW, this is the Organization for the uh, Chemical uh, Weapons Convention, we're trying to get those inspectors in probably uh, within the week. You know the challenges we face where Russia has six times in the UN uh, rejected and uh, made certain 
that uh, we could not get uh, in investigators in. All right, so Katie, should the U.S. be cracking down harder on Russia for their support of Assad? Absolutely, and you've seen a disconnect between the White House and even U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley in which she said that we are going to impose sanctions on Russia, but then you saw uh, President Trump publicly denouncing her as saying that that wasn't something that was agreed upon, and you're seeing this overall breakdown within different government agencies and different government officials of what we should be doing with Russia, and I think that sends not only a very distorted message to Americans, but also the international community as well. But I absolutely think that we need to be acting uh, pretty, I don't want to say aggressively, but pretty clearly that we're not going to support Russia's involvement with Assad. Now, Andrew, as Katie mentioned, there was an issue where UN Ambassador Nikki Haley said that we were going to Im be imposing sanctions. The White House then said that wasn't true. Are you concerned about that sort of disconnect? No. I, in fact, I actually applaud and admire Nikki Haley, who stood up for what she thought was her truth. She said, with all due respect, I don't get confused. She retook her authority, her credibility and legitimacy, domestically and internationally. And it was beautiful, actually, the way she handled that. All that occurred was a, a miscommunication. The uh, Russian embassy was, was informed uh, while uh, Nikki Haley, according to reports, was, was, was on TV. It's not clear exactly when this information was transferred, but it was a, a simple uh, m uh, absence of, of effective communication and compared to the Benghazi when they ask for assistance this is nothing and not as detrimental. Real now, quickly on the issue of sanctions because we have to wrap yes. up this segment we had a great debate so far do you think that the U.S. should be imposing sanctions on Russia and right? do you think they need to be cracking down more on Russia for their support of Assad? I agree with President Trump he has been one of the toughest uh, one of the toughest on Russia I mean let's take a look at what happens sanctions you don't throw them out randomly you throw them when a, a, a state behaves in a way that deserves sanctions. So in March, we put on uh, some, some sanctions because of their involvement in our election. On the April 6th sanctions announced by, by President Mnuchin, these were some of the strongest sanctions ever imposed on Russia. You had 17 government officials, 12 Kremlin-linked companies, you had uh, 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 seven oligarchs, or, uh, and you had a bank and an arms deal. And these are significant for three reasons. First, it suffocates uh, the entities that allow Russia to circumvent the sanctions by uh, going after publicly traded companies, right? I mean, the, the oligarchs, they used to move their companies out to London, Hong Kong, and New York to avoid sanctions. If you could wrap this up your stops. point in 10 seconds, we're running out of time here. Of course, and, and uh, it sends a clear message, and, and the stock market, by the way, when we in Russia collapsed by 7.8%, this is the biggest in four years, the ruble down 8.3%. So something clearly has, has been different about these sanctions, and they have been very tough. And sanctions are put when countries deserve them, not randomly. One second or one sentence response from you and then we'll wrap up. Absolutely. I do agree that I think sanctions obviously have a very clear political and even economic uh, cause to two countries. And I do think it's important for us to, again, send that message to Russia. But I think I... I personally can't get over the disconnect between Ambassador Nikki Haley. She was actually interviewed in which she said, in which Trump had responded that she was confused and there was a miscommunication. And she was very Larry clearly, and she, and she very clearly said perfect. that I wasn't, I wasn't said the confused. Relationship is perfect. So there clearly is miscommunication between. All right, we're going to have to end our segment concern. there, guys. Obama Sorry, just we've had such a good debate here, but we are running way out of time. So after this, we're going to turn from foreign to domestic policy, and we're going to talk about Speaker Ryan's impending retirement and the upcoming midterm. So. Stay tuned for more excellent debate. The George Washington University at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Connecting all that Washington has to offer with an intellectual environment that drives progress. Transforming vision into action. Offering learning experiences that are rigorous, real-time, and real-world. In a city shaping the future, George Washington is a place where faculty and students don't just study the world, they work to change it. Turning now to Congress and the big decision from House Speaker Paul Ryan. This year will be his last in the Capitol building. He will not seek re-election in the upcoming midterms. Instead, he says he will spend more time with his family in Wisconsin. But some find the timing suspicious, questioning whether it might be the frustration of dealing with President Trump that has led to his decision. Here he is on CBS This Morning giving his explanation. 
What happened to Paul Ryan? You know, why didn't he speak up? Why didn't he stand up to the president about things that many believe are personally offensive to you? And that if we had a different person in the White House, that you would not be leaving. No, that's not the case. It, it, it's really a timing of family, and it's a fact that I've accomplished much of the agenda I came here to accomplish. The speaker not running again here in 2018 will also have real implications both in the midterm races and, of course, in Republican leadership. We'll talk about those in a moment. But first, Andrew, do you believe that Trump was a factor in Ryan deciding to retire? Uh, maybe. The Trump's, or, uh, excuse me, Speaker Ryan has said that he has a good relationship with uh, President Trump and, you know, he's not Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, so I take him to his word. Uh, he said that he wanted to resign because he wants to spend time with his children. Now, look. He was a vice presidential candidate, one of the youngest chairmen of Ways and Means, and uh, he could have easily left, made millions of dollars on K Street. But no, he came back, he, he, he wanted to do what he could for his country, and he advanced, worked with the president, tried to work with Democrats, but we all know how, what that response uh, resulted, and tried to move forward to the country. So he's taking time off for personal reasons, which many have said he could have done before, and I admire his willingness and, and uh, dedication to the prosperity of our country. Katie, what was your initial reaction when you heard that Paul Ryan would be retiring? I think we can see from previous officials in government that Trump is not afraid to fire or get rid of people that don't necessarily agree with him or cause him, I would say, a little public embarrassment. And I think the health care bill, I think, really em embarrassed the GOP and the entirety of the Republican Party. And I think that uh, difficulty with Ryan trying to get that through in Congress definitely didn't look good for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if Trump more or less helped his res How do, you do you think explain? the president has enough influence within the Republican Party to push out a House Speaker? I think he has enough. I, mm, that's a good question. I think that he has enough favoritism because he does see, and I think if the Congress, congressmen are smart, they see that Trump does have relatively high approval ratings among Republican voters. So if they are smart, they would be supporting Trump in his overall decisions with the government, especially as I think we can see he would likely run for re-election and, and try again to have some kind of unity going into the midterm elections in 2018. Could I ask a question? How do you explain then that, that the health care bill passed the House but failed in the Senate? You said the health care bill was a big component of uh, Ryan resigning, but it passed in the House. But it didn't pass in the entirety of the in the entirety of the Congress, and I think it's important to also know that there the was Senate, also yeah. there was also a lot of Republican um, disapproval of the original bills. Originally, I mean, you're looking at Senator McCain, my own representative. I know he's a senator, but my own representative, um, Mike or Mike Fitzpatrick, was one of the Republicans that Ryan has were no, not nothing a, to do. Well, with actually, this all gets to the question that I wanted to ask next, which is what you think the Speaker's legacy will be. So I'll ask Katie first, and then I'll come to you, Andrew. What will Paul Ryan's legacy be? I think his quote that he accomplished much of what he set out to do is pretty false in the sense that there was a lot of a lot of stuff that was on the ticket for the Republican Party that they wanted to get through, namely the, the health care pill, but you also want to talk about the budget. I mean, that basically caused a government shutdown, and they want to say that this is some pride and glory that they had, but there was a lot of difficulty getting there. So other than that, I mean, the only other legacy you could see is the Muslim ban, which wasn't even Congress uh, to begin with. I think a lot of the original agenda or the original items on the agenda that they had set was not actually succeeded and was not successful. what do you think his legacy will be first and foremost uh, the muslim ban was was not supported in fact i believe it was criticized by speaker ryan and um i think his legacy will be someone who came in he's a man of honor tried to work with democrats as you mentioned the shutdown the schumer shutdown ryan could not help it he tried to work to pass uh, DACA. The president promised to put DACA. Democrats wanted to be obstructionist. Okay. But Paul Ryan really came in, put values down, and led with honor. And I think that's what his legacy will be, because he did it for his country. Remember, he could have stepped out in 2012 after being failed by his presidential candidate, but he chose to help America, and that's you, splendid. You say that it's not Speaker Ryan's fault of the shutdown, but you're talking about the Republicans having all three branches of government, or all, all the House, the Senate, and also the president, the presidency. So how were they not able to get past a health care bill when that was something that was accomplished by the Obama era? As a, as a Republican and as a politician, your, your goal is to get legislation passed and to work across the board. And how it's almost embarrassing, wouldn't you say, that they weren't able to get this passed with a majority in the House, the Senate, and even a Republican candidate. First and foremost, the health care bill died in the Senate, not in the House. It passed. Ryan pushed that effort. Second, as you may know, many of these bills require more than a simple majority, uh, and it requires 
many aspects, including the omnibus and, and the spending bill, require 60 votes. And the Democrats, they have, uh, we, the Republicans only have 52. So as you said, bipartisanship is key in American democracy. But what you have is 33 nominees, not approved by, uh, by the Senate. We had a filibuster. This was more than Obama and Bush combined in their first year. And so don't tell me that the key is more bipartisanship when the ones who were supposed to help with bipartisanship in the Senate refused to do it. All right, now getting back to the issue of Paul Ryan here, uh, who's your pick, Andrew, to be the next speaker when Paul Ryan retires? Kevin McCarthy, you know, he threw his hat in in the race in 2015 after Boehner resigned. He is a fantastic liaison with the White House. He has an excellent re relationship with President Trump. He's also very, as very close with, you know, Mark Meadows, chairman of the Freedom Caucus. You have also more with the Northeastern Republicans all over. He has very good ties. And uh, he's been a good deputy, I think, to Paul Ryan as his assistant in passing a lot of legislation. And uh, I support Kevin's bid. Now, if he doesn't get the vote, that's a different situation. But uh, he is, I think, the right man to step up to the plate and take What do you think has changed since the last time he stepped up to the plate and then backed out? Um, for one, his experience as a majority leader under an excellent, you know, boss or leader, Ryan. He's taught them the ropes. They work very well. He also has a fantastic relationship with the executive branch, which, you know, Obama, it's, it was a little tough for Republicans to have a relationship because he would never invite them over. Obama would never speak with, with congressional Republicans. And uh, the, the, the third thing that I think has changed is practice. Sure. He's going to learn from his mistakes. He's going to address them. I mean, it's, it's 2015. It's been three years. I would hope <laughs> that a House majority leader would have the, the people in, in, in place to help him develop a winning strategy uh, based on the failures of the last time and move forward. Katie, who do you think the next speaker is going to be? I'd have to agree with Andrew, and I think that Representative McCarthy definitely has a strong bid, obviously, from his previous run, but I think it's really going to come down to looking at the coming months and what the midterm elections are going to look like. So speaking of the midterms, Andrew, what effect do you think that this resignation will have on Republicans running in 2018? What effect it would have on Republicans running or on the, on, on the, the ability of the GOP to control the House? Either one. The second one is probably the more pertinent question here. Do okay. you think the GOP will be able to control the House with Speaker Ryan stepping down? I think these prospects of a blue wave remind me very much of uh, 2016. I mean, I read Huffington Post on the morning of the election. 396 electoral votes, they said Clinton would happen. They promised a blue wave in Texas, all over the place. And what happened? <laughs> Republicans flipped Michigan for the first time since 1988. We had Pennsylvania. We almost, uh, you know, Wisconsin and Minnesota were in the mix there. And I do think there is a threat of a blue wave, but it's by no means certain. Let's just take a look at fundraising. The DNC, they've raised $80 million, and they have cash on hand. Um, they have 43 million, or excuse me, 10 million cash on hand, 6 million in debt. The RNC, they raised 158, cash on hand, 43 million. And by the way, we have much more, m m many more small donations, less than $200 compared to the Democrats. So that's one factor. And the second factor I'd like to allude to is complacency. There's no platform that the Democrats were running. When Nancy Pelosi took over the House in 2006, she had the 100-hour plan, promised to uh, increase federal minimum wage, uh, prescription drug costs, lobbying. Now what are they running? I don't even know. You have Connor Lamb, who says he hates Nancy Pelosi, firing an AR-15 on his, uh, on his uh, campaign ads. You have Bernie Sanders and Keith Ellison, who's calling for $15 minimum wage. And then you have, uh, you know, establishment politicians like Pelosi, who's been in charge since 2003. I don't know. They're not going to buy it. There's nothing. Katie, I want to ask you as well. Does this, ref this does this retirement affect the Democrat strategy for the upcoming midterms? I think it looks favorably upon the Democrat strategy. I mean, you're you're talking about donations and you're talking about funding, but I think Democrats are finally getting their act together by really focusing on these states, such as my home state of Pennsylvania, such as actually in Texas, Ted Cruz is being out donated by his uh, Democrat uh, opponent right now. I think it. Again, that's the Senate. But it's still important when you're talking about the midterm elections as a whole. There's actually, and forecasts on multiple platforms, not just the Huffington Post, show that the Democrats have a very strong uh, forecast of reclaiming the House at the moment. Is and Huffington it, Post fake news? I was talking, I didn't say that. Okay. But I think across the board, when you're looking at Politico, when you're looking at uh, the Gallup polls that are coming up, there are multiple strong indications that, sure. that the Democrats are going to reclaim the, the House. And what does that say then at the local level with 
if with people and constituents really being no, more actually I'm sorry we're out of time here another great debate in this segment that'll have to be the last word there but after this break it's rapid fire if it's anything like these two segments it's gonna be good so stay with us it's on us to stand up to those who tell us it's not our business to tell our friends if what they're doing is wrong it's on us to do something anything to keep an assault from happening to be more than a bystander to create an environment where women feel and are safe. It's on us to change the way we talk about women. To be part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's on us to say something when our friends are being stupid. To hold our friends accountable for their actions. It's on us to, to look, look out, out for, for someone, someone who's had, who's too, had much too much to drink. to drink. To step in if a friend is doing something that could lead to sexual assault. It's on us to not give our friends a pass. To never blame the victim to stop a sexual assault any way we can. I am a member of the George Washington University community, and it's on us to end sexual violence. Our panel joins us again now for Rapid Fire, some quick answers to some quick questions. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg on the hot seat last week. He was called to testify and answer questions about privacy on social media. This after a massive scandal involving tens of millions of users' data landing in the wrong hands, the hands of Cambridge Analytica, a firm used by the Trump campaign. Plenty of in-the-weeds details on this issue, but since this is rapid fire, I want to ask you each just this question. Katie, we'll start with you. Should the government regulate Facebook and social media more heavily? Absolutely. I think as we have seen with this whole this whole debacle it is important that when people are putting their information online with the expectation that it's not going to fall in the wrong hands you want to make sure that you have your privacy and your protections it's almost why do you have a wallet rather than just having your credit card or your id on your shoulder because even though it might not totally alleviate the problem it definitely makes it a lot harder for people to steal your information andrew should there be more regulations on social media companies there should be reg regulation if facebook doesn't change uh, unlike my democratic counterpart here i don't believe in just throwing out regulations for the sake of it. Regulations should focus on privacy, as you mentioned, but Facebook should be given the option to self-implement those. And also, uh, it should be on censorship. I mean, what, what came out with this diamond and silk, these two uh, conservative uh, speakers, and also uh, Michigan State candidate Nesbitt, who was censored completely when he was running, I think that's despicable, and that should be either regulated if Facebook does not change itself. There's a difference between censorship and regulation, though, and I think that's an important line to draw. All right, moving on to the next rapid fire question here, you're good. Last week, the FBI raided the home of Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. The president lambasted the move as an affront to attorney-client privilege, although there is a distinct legal mechanism for conducting such raids. Andrew, what do these raids suggest to you? Well, let's consider three things. First, the inspector general of the DOJ just uh, suggested criminal and civilian indictment for McCabe. And second, these uh, raids were not based on information pertaining to the Russian or obstruction of justice by the Trump administration. And third, I think uh, Mueller was trying to bait Trump to do something extreme and maybe do something out of the realm, and it didn't work. Obviously, it didn't work. It's been backfiring, and the only result of this Russia probe so far has been Comey admitting to lie and leak and Andrew McCabe being under contempt. Katie, what was your reaction to these raids? Look, I think if the FBI is coming knocking at your door, it's not just something that we can brush under the rug. There's clearly some information there that they thought was pertinent to this overall investigation, not only just with uh, with Russia, but the overall Trump it's campaign. Not true. It's but we don't know yet, and that was the point of the FBI raid, wasn't it? To see if there was anything. They got they and got a warrant. Found other crimes, which is why he uh, he recommended a warrant. Yeah, and criminal not criminal to Russia, that we know so far, but criminal record. A year and a half that we know so far. I think if the FBI is coming knocking at your door, I think it's important and there's obviously some kind of information that they don't want us knowing about or that there's something that they found that they thought was important to go in, into not only his home but his hotel rooms. There's clearly something there that needs to be uncovered and I think to suggest that it shouldn't have been done is almost a gross understatement of the justice system. Moving on now, over the past several months, teachers around the country have been going on strike, first in West Virginia, most recently in Oklahoma. Andrew, do you believe these teachers are justified in striking? Absolutely. I stand with these teachers who have, you know, their, their salary is not at all what it should be, and they will benefit the most from increasing the standard deduction from 6,000 to 12,000, and they will stand the, mo the most by getting the, uh, the 1,000 breadcrumbs that Nancy Pelosi says. And I do support them. I think the federal government should be behind them in terms of support, 
But the solution is not just throwing money because the federal contributions only account for 13% of state educational systems. Katie, what's your response to these strikes? I do stand with the teachers as well. They are simply asking for a 5% increase in their salaries, which if you're looking at the overall totals, that's nothing compared to other other things that Republicans in the Congress and Congress are calling for, such as arming teachers, that would cost significantly more money than a 5% increase in salaries. And I think it's important that we support those that are very instrumental in educating our next generation, um, especially when you're talking about these are all in red states as well. So what does that then say of local, local and also Senate uh, Republicans in those states? You're talking about Oklahoma, you're talking about West Virginia. All of which, uh, very right. Good. And with that, we're going to have to end Oaks. our debate here on Colonial Crossfire. Katie O'Connell, Andrew Colreiser, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Thank when you. we come back, Michael Schnell has our debate fact check. So George's been doing a pretty good job since he started here, huh? Yeah, but I don't think he understands Casual Friday yet. Hey, George. What's up, George? Yeah, real presidential. We had no idea he would bring the colonial army. Whoosh! Ah, uh, Ah, uh, hey, hey, George, uh, I think you have an update for Firefox. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers monitored our debate and Michael Schnell is here now to fill us in on what we missed. Michael. Thanks, Casey. Let's start on the left with our Democratic debater, Katie O'Connell. One point that needs a closer look was when Katie said that the UN was opposed to the US conducting airstrikes against the Assad regime in Syria. This is incorrect. The UN Security Council in fact supported the operation and voted down a resolution by the Russian government to condemn the act. Staying on the topic of Syria, Katie said that Trump denounced U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley when she said that the U.S. should impose sanctions on Russia in response to the airstrikes. However, Trump did not denounce Haley. He just disagreed with her. Now moving to the right, our Republican debater, Andrew Colreiser. Andrew mentioned that on the morning of the 2016 presidential election, the Huffington Post published an article predicting that Hillary Clinton would win with 396 electoral votes. However, after looking back at the article, it was noted that the Huffington Post forecast Clinton to win with only 323 electoral votes, a difference of 73 votes. And finally, during the debate, Andrew said that Steve Mnuchin is the president of the United States. After thoroughly looking into this claim, the fact check team is certain in its correction that Mnuchin is not the president. Rather, he is the secretary of the treasury. But you never know what could happen in the future. That's all for this edition of Colonial Crossfire Fact Check. I'm Michael Schnell. Casey, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Michael. It's now time for Spilled Milk. Here's our tribute to the very best of late night political comedy. Yep. These Trump stories are so random and insane. I feel like a contestant on Chopped. What the hell am I supposed to do with all these ingredients? <laughs> I mean, I knew he was going to try to create a distraction, but I thought it'd be something small, like tweeting the N-word at Tristan Thompson. I didn't know he was going to put us in a full war. Plus, isn't he going to jail soon? He shouldn't be signing us up for stuff. He should be kissing us on the forehead and telling us to take care of mommy. You know, you know, I, I, know, I know our first instinct is to hate, and it's also weird that Trump makes it all about himself, but, but Trump is right, right. If it wasn't for his craziness, North Korea would have never come to the table. You know, that's what he did. Trump is like the near-death experience that makes people forget why they were fighting in the first place. <laughs> that's who he is. Our focus is on helping the folks who work in the mailrooms and the machine shops of America, the plumbers, the carpenters, the cops, the teachers, the truck drivers, the pipe fitters, the people that like me best. Well, <laughs> that, that is clearly nonsense, because if this bill were really helping the people that like Donald Trump best, it would exclusively benefit Eric Trump, Roseanne Barr, and anyone who's ever looked both ways before whispering, it was the Jews. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. Be sure to check us out online at www.gw-tv.com and follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Casey Decker. 
Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you right back here next time.